Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Role models play an important part in all of our lives, whether we seek them out or not. And whether we walk the Buddhist path or not, they can have the power to shape the direction we take and the ability to influence the decisions that follow on from there. Life has its ebbs and flows, challenges and opportunities, and at every turn we often seek wise counsel, examples that we can follow or emulate, people that we can respect or look up to, and much, much more. On the Buddhist path, the Buddha is for all intents and purposes our most eminent role model, teacher, and the perfectly enlightened one. There are also many noble and great disciples of the Buddha, those who have been ordained as well as lay people who are commended and praised by the Buddha for different qualities or aspects of their practice. We will ask, who are our role models? And feature some of these great disciples of the Buddha. The aim is to learn about these noble beings and delight in their lives and accomplishments, highlight the importance of recognizing them as worthy role models, and as inspiration towards the Noble Eightfold Path. Today we'll be looking at one of the monk disciples of the Buddha, and that is Venerable Nanda Thera. He was the half-brother of the Buddha, so the son of King Suddhodana and Mahapajapati, and he was only a couple days younger than the Buddha. It was at his coronation and betrothal to Janapada Kalyani that the Buddha took him to the monastery. And while he was there, he requested for him to ordain as a monk. And because he was unable to refuse the Buddha's request, he agreed with reluctance to ordain. And so we learned that he struggled with sensual lust and other defilements. That's what we're going to look at today. And he didn't really delight in spiritual life in the beginning and wanted to disrobe and return to lay life, the lesser life. But the Buddha stepped in and events unfolded and this encouraged him to apply himself to the spiritual life and he was successful, very successful. And he was declared the foremost of monk disciples who guard the sense doors, Indriyesu Guttadavara, and as we know this is one of the training qualities. So he was the foremost of the monk disciples. In fact, he was the foremost of all the disciples because when you look at the suttas, there is no nun that is declared foremost at this particular quality and of course no lay people as well. So this is very important when it comes to looking at sensuality, going out through our senses, seeking pleasure. And this story is very interesting because Venerable Nanda Thera, he had the best life. He was going to be king, he had the most beautiful woman that was going to be his wife and probably would have had other wives as well. And he would have had all the trappings of that. And yet very similar to the Buddha, he renunciated and with great difficulty, he overcame the sensual lust as we will see. And I think that's something very, very important for us to look at in taking someone like Venerable Nanda Thera as a role model to see what he actually went through, to see the things that are very similar in our lives that make it so hard for us to not pleasure seek and to look at the example of Venerable Nanda to see how he overcame that. And his story is a very interesting one. Now, Janapada Kalyani, who he was meant to marry, she eventually decided to ordain so she, she was waiting for Nanda to come back, but clearly he didn't come back. Surprisingly, she didn't actually marry somebody else, but eventually she actually ordained as a bhikkhuni and she realized Sotapanna initially. And then through the teaching of the Buddha, both times, the first time as a Sotapanna, she realized through something that the Buddha actually showed her because she was also enamored with beauty and out with the sense pleasures as well. And then through a second teaching of the Buddha, she then realized Arahantship. So these are people who are quite important in the time of the Buddha for us to look at. And they're people with ordinary qualities that we have, which is the sensual lust, the passion for things, getting absorbed through the senses. If we go to the legends of Venerable Nanda Thera, and this is Nanda Thera Apadana, specifically number 15, what we learn is that at the time of Padamuttara Buddha, 
he had the very good fortune to make an offering of a koma cloth to Padmutra Buddha. And as a result of doing that, the Buddha said that due to giving this piece of cloth, you will have the color of gold. So you can imagine that the result of it would have been this glow, this golden glow or hue. And the Buddha went on to say, experiencing twofold bliss incited by your wholesome roots, you will be the younger brother of Gautama, the Blessed One. Happy by nature, but lustful, you will be greedy for pleasures. Being incited by the Buddha, you will then go forth renouncing. After you've renounced the world, there incited by your wholesome roots, knowing well all the defilements, you'll reach Nibbana undefiled. So as we now know, this is exactly what had happened. And in this particular legend of Venerable Nandatera, we learn that four times he was a king named Chela, and this was in the seven thousandth eon or Mahakapa. He was again a king four times called Upachela and this was 60,000 eons or Mahakapas ago and also 5,000 eons ago. He was also another ruler named Chela but he was a Chakravati ruler so one that was endowed with the seven gems and a very very great king and we learned that he had the four analytical modes and the eight deliverances and the six special knowledges. So he was a very skilled and wise uh, student of the Buddha and one that became an Arahant. We have another legend of Venerable Nanda Thera and this is Nandaka Thera Apadana number 408. And it begins by talking about his past birth as a deer hunter looking for spotted deer. At the time he saw the Buddha and this Buddha was named Anuradha. So when he saw him he decided to make an offering. So he gathered four sticks of wood, he placed them in four corner spots and he built a pavilion and covered it with lotus blooms and greeted Anuradha Buddha and he put his bow aside after offering and covering the pavilion and he requested to ordain under the Buddha. So a short time after going forth, he was afflicted with illness and it was quite a serious one. So he passed away right then and there. And then it next goes on to say that he was reborn into the Tutsita Deva realm. And what it says is, there a mansion made out of gold is produced according to wish. My divine carriage stands in wait, a thousand horse yoked vehicle ascending into that carriage I travel according to wish. When I'm going out from there, Having been reborn as a deva, a pavilion's held up for me, a hundred leagues on every side. I always nestle on a bed that's constantly strewn with flowers, and from the sky pink lotuses are raining on me all the time. When the rays of light are throbbing and the sun's heat scorches the world, the heat is not oppressing me. That's the fruit of a pavilion. I pass beyond all bad rebirth, the states of woe are close to me, in a pavilion or tree root, burning heat is not known by me. Fixing perception on the earth, I cross over the great ocean. That's my well done kamma, the fruit of doing that Buddha puja. And so it goes on to talk about the fruit of that good kamma, that having offered this pavilion to Anuradha Buddha, it lasts a very long time. We now come to the present and final birth of Venerable Nandatera. And we know that he was born as Prince Nanda, half-brother to the Buddha. And at the time, the Buddha was residing at Veluvana Monastery in Rajagaha. So this is from Dhammapada, verse 13 to 14, Nanda Theravatu. And King Suddhodana kept repeatedly asking the Buddha to come to Kapilavatu. And eventually the Buddha made the journey in the company of 20,000 Arahants. This was at the time that Prince Nanda was having his coronation ceremony and the betrothal to Princess Janapada Kalyani. The Buddha went to the palace for alms and handed over his alms bowl to Prince Nanda. But the Buddha departed without taking back the bowl. So Prince Nanda holding the bowl had to follow the Buddha. When Princess Janapada Kalyani saw him following the Buddha, 
she rushed out and cried out to the prince to come back soon. But at the monastery, the Buddha requested Prince Nanda to join the order of the Sangha. And Prince Nanda had difficulty refusing, so he ordained. Later on, the Buddha had moved to the monastery built by Anathapindika, so this was at Jeta's Grove in Savati. And Nanda was there as well, residing there, but he was very discontented and found little pleasure in the life of a bhikkhu. He kept wanting to return to the life of a householder. And because he kept remembering the words of Princess Janapada Kalyani, imploring him to return soon, he was very troubled by this. And so we learn further about how the Buddha teaches Nanda in terms of overcoming this. And we'll look at that in the next sutta, not here. When Buddha explained the nature of Nanda, what he was like before, he likened it to a poorly thatched house. So the saying of the Buddha is, just like a poorly thatched house, rain penetrates. So also an undeveloped mind, lust penetrates. And then just like a well thatched house, rain does not penetrate. So also a developed mind, lust does not penetrate. So what's really important here is our development. And as we'll sh we shall see from the story of Venerable Nanda Thera, if you develop the mind, if you follow the instructions of the Buddha, then things such as sensual desire and all the other hindrances that follow on from that, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and then also the doubt, those things don't take hold. But when the mind is undeveloped, when you keep allowing it to go into the unwholesome, towards things that you like, towards sense pleasures, then of course it's as if rain is coming in into, into the house just like it does into the mind. So it's very important to actually make sure you develop the mind. Let's now look at the teaching that the Buddha gives to Venerable Nanda. Let's refer to Nanda Sutta in Udana 3.2. At the time, Venerable Nanda confessed to many monks, I have no great delight, Venerable Friends, living the spiritual life. I am not able to endure the spiritual life. Having disavowed the training, I will return to what is inferior. Then one of the monks who had heard what Venerable Nanda said went to the Buddha and told the Buddha what Venerable Nanda had said. So the Buddha asked him to go and bring Venerable Nanda to come and see him. Then after doing that, Venerable Nanda came to see the Buddha. And the Buddha said to Venerable Nanda after he paid respects, and he said, is it true as it seems, Nanda, that you confess this to many monks, saying, I have no great delight, venerable friends, living the spiritual life. I am not able to endure the spiritual life. Having disavowed the training, I will return to what is inferior. And venerable Nanda replies, Yes, venerable sir. Then the Buddha says to him, But why do you, Nanda, have no great delight living the spiritual life, are not able to endure the spiritual life, and having disavowed the training, will return to what is inferior? And so Venerable Nanda then answers the Buddha by saying, As he was leaving from home, a Sakyan girl, the most beautiful in the country, with her hair half combed, having looked around, said this to me, Master, may you quickly return. And remembering that, Venerable Sir, I have no great delight living the spiritual life. I am not able to endure the spiritual life, and having disavowed the training, I will return to what is inferior. Then the Buddha takes Venerable Nanda's arm, just as a strong man might stretch out a bent arm or bend in an outstretched arm, in the same way he disappeared from Jetha's grove and reappeared amongst the Tabatingsa Devas. At the time, 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs had come to attend Sukha, the Lord of the Devas. Then the Buddha says to Venerable Nanda, Do you see, Nanda, these 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs? Yes, Venerable Sir. What do you think about this, Nanda? Who has the most perfect form, is the most fair to behold, is the most pleasing? The Sakyan girl, the most beautiful woman in the country, or these 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs? Then Venerable Nanda answers, Like a disfigured monkey, Venerable Sir, with its ears and nose cut off, so is the Sakyan girl, Venerable Sir. The most beautiful woman in the country, compared with these 500 celestial nymphs, she does not count. She is not even a fraction. She's not even half a fraction. She's not even to be compared. 
These 500 celestial nymphs certainly have the most perfect form, are the most fair to behold, are the more pleasing. Then the Buddha declares, Take delight, Nanda, take delight, Nanda. I am your surety for gaining 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs. Then Nanda replies, If Venerable Sir, the Blessed One, is my surety for gaining 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs, I will take great delight, Venerable Sir, in living the spiritual life under the Blessed One. And then they left the Kavathinsa Deva realm and they reappeared in Jetha's grove. Now the monks heard that Venerable Nanda had taken a liking for these celestial nymphs and they said he's living the spiritual life for the sake of celestial nymphs. The Blessed One, it seems, is his surety for gaining 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs. And so then they accosted him and they said to him, It seems Venerable Nanda is a hireling. It seems Venerable Nanda is a lackey. He is living the spiritual life for the sake of celestial nymphs. And the Blessed One, it seems, is his surety for gaining 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs. So then Venerable Nanda, at the mocking words of the monks, he was distressed, troubled, ashamed and disgusted. And while dwelling solitary, secluded, heedful, ardent and resolute, after no long time attained the good for which the sons of a good family rightly go forth from home to homelessness, the unsurpassed conclusion to the spiritual life and dwelt having known, having directly experienced and having attained Nibbana himself in this very life. Then he knew, destroyed his birth, accomplished his the spiritual life, done is what ought to be done, there is no more of this mundane state. Then a certain Devata, when the night had passed, having lit up the whole of Jetha's grove with his unsurpassed beauty, went to the Blessed One, and after going and worshipping the Blessed One, he stood to one side. While standing to one side, that Devata said to the Buddha, Venerable Nanda, Venerable Sir, the Gracious One's brother, his mother's sister's son, through destruction of the taints, without taints, freed in mind, freed through wisdom, dwells having known, having directly experienced and attained Nibbana himself in this very life. And this knowledge arose in the Blessed One. Then Venerable Nanda, when that night had passed, went to the Blessed One, and after going and respecting the Blessed One, he sat down to one side. While sat on one side, Venerable Nanda said to the Blessed One, That, Venerable Sir, for which the Blessed One was my surety, for gaining 500 celestial dove-footed nymphs, I free the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, from that promise. Then the Buddha confirmed that he saw that with his own mind, and he also confirmed that a devata announced it to him as well. Then the Buddha went on to say, when, Nanda, your mind was freed from the taints without attachment, then was I freed from that promise. Then the Blessed One, having understood the significance of it, on that occasion uttered the exalted utterance. He who has got out of the quagmire, who has crushed the thorn of sense desire, who has arrived at the destruction of delusion, that monk does not shake in regard to pleasure and pain. So this is a wonderful account of how Venerable Nanda came out of all the things that were polluting his mind, how he dedicated himself to practice, and soon realized arahantship. One of the aspects to Venerable Nanda's story that often surprises people is his willingness to bend to the Buddha's request. So when he was asked to go to the monastery, when he was requested to ordain, and later when he struggled with the spiritual path, how he followed the Buddha and listened to his teaching and then applied himself to the practice. Now, there's a story in the Jatakas that kind of explains a little bit of that quality, that it's something that he had nurtured from lifetime to lifetime. So this story tells of a hostile king who armed his state elephant and was about to go into battle. But at the site of the battle, the elephant didn't want to go towards the battlefield. It was actually scared. And at that time, the trainer had to be called upon and he encouraged the elephant with a few words. He said to the elephant, you are a hero whose home is on the battlefield. There stands the gate before you. Why don't you turn and go at it? Make haste, break through the iron bar, beat the pillars down, crash through the gates made fast for war and entered the town. And just by listening to those few words, it was enough for him to turn around and go straight into battle. And by force he entered the city and it won the, the king the battle. 
And so when the story was finished, the Buddha actually identified the birth by saying Nanda was the elephant, Ananda was the king, and the trainer was himself. So what we see from that are qualities similar to Suvacha, easy to instruct. And as we know from before that being Suvacha is something that's very helpful towards the Dhamma path. When we're easy to instruct, it's easy for us to listen to the Buddha's words, easy for us to follow the instructions, and to also heed the Buddha's words when it comes to all the defilement. So in this case, when it comes to Venerable Nanda, this is a quality that he's cultivated through lifetimes. And this is one of the examples of those lifetimes. And so he's very fortunate because, as you can see, by bending, by being willing to follow, willing to instruct the good person, in this case it's the Buddha, he benefited greatly. He benefited because he overcame sensual lust, he overcame all the worldly challenges or all the worldly enticements and at the same time he applied himself to the Buddha's instructions and realized arahantship. So it's a very good example for us to, to know when you follow someone as superior as the Buddha, you really listen to his instructions, you become suvacha, easy to instruct, then you can expect good results. And Venerable Nanda is an example of this because he became foremost at guarding the doors to the sense faculties and he really did overcome a lot of sensual lust. And there are other accounts of Venerable Nanda before his arahantship where he was indulging in sensual pleasures. And it wasn't just simply that he was thinking about Princess Janapatha Kalyani, there were other things as well. So in this sutta, the Nanda Sutta, Sanyutta Nikaya, chapter 21, discourse number 8. At the time at Savati, Venerable Nanda, he put on well-pressed and well-ironed robes, painted his eyes, took a glazed bowl and approached the Blessed One. Having paid homage to the Blessed One, he sat down to one side and the Blessed One said to him, Nanda, this is not proper for you, a clansman who has gone forth out of conviction from the household life into homelessness, that you wear well-pressed and well-ironed robes, paint your eyes and carry a glazed bowl. This is proper for you, Nanda, a clansman who has gone forth out of conviction from the household life into homelessness, that you be a forest dweller, an arms food eater, a rag robes wearer, and that you dwell indifferent to sensual pleasures. This is what the Blessed One said, who further said this, When shall I see Nanda as a forest dweller, wearing robes stitched from rags, subsisting on the scraps of strangers, indifferent towards sensual pleasures. Then sometime later, the Venerable Nanda became a forest dweller, an arms food eater, a rag robes wearer, and he dwelt indifferent to sensual pleasures. So there are many ways that one can indulge in sense pleasures, even as a monk. And in our case, this is a pointer to what we need to look at, that there are things that are hindering the path. There are things that are blocking us from the path of wisdom because we're still enamored by certain things, particularly towards ourselves. So in the case of Venerable Nanda, the fact that he wore well-pressed, well-ironed robes, painted his eyes, and he took a glazed bowl, there's a certain amount of conceit there. He wants to look good, and he wants to look attractive. Why else would you iron your robes and make them look very nice and, and paint your eye? And the fact that he took a glazed bowl was also something of maybe wanting to feel a little superior. Maybe this was the legacy of being born into the royal household. But in our case, what this says is that the path of one who is walking this noble path, and we don't have to be ordained as such, but it's one of humility, simplicity, not trying to beautify, not trying to adorn. And that's one of the other things that Venerable Nanda is known for, wanting to adorn himself, to look good, to look superior at times. In our case, when it comes to household life, at some point when you really see the Dhamma, you let go of how your hair looks, putting on all the right makeup, wanting to be superior, having all the trappings of a superior worldly life, the right car, the right job, the right house, all the adornments in the house, all the jewelry, all the trappings that tell you that you have some status in the world. Now, it doesn't mean that you give up everything. If you want to do that, then you go forth into the monastic life. 
But as householders, there are certain things that one can do that help the path. And of course, this happens quite more naturally when you have wisdom that no longer are you enamored in wearing lots of jewelry, making sure your makeup is right, making sure you have the best hairstyle, you have all the right fashion and all the trappings. At some point, you go, this is good enough. Otherwise, it is never enough. So this teaching in relation to Venerable Ananda, it's a very good example for us to really look into it. And each person is different. And we also lead by example how we live the life with complexity or with simplicity that helps to show the world. If we're walking this spiritual path, is it about complexity or is it about simplicity? If we have children, what example are we setting for our children? To grasp more central pleasures? or to let go of central pleasures. So there's a lot in this when it comes to how we deal with central pleasures. What is the type of habit tendencies that we are breaking, not strengthening, not reinforcing? So the Buddha is very wise in terms of what he says in particular for a monk, but you can extrapolate what is useful for a householder from this. There are no teachings given by Venerable Nanda in the suttas. However, there is one training rule on Nanda. And it said that he was seven centimeters shorter than the Buddha. This is in the Vinaya. But he wore a robe that was the same size as the Buddha's. So when the senior monks saw him coming, they thought it was the Buddha and got up from their seats. But when he came close, they realized who it was and they complained and criticized him. How can Venerable Nanda wear a robe the size of the Buddha's? And then the Buddha asks, is it true, Nanda, that you do this? And he says, it's true, sir. So the Buddha rebukes him, Nanda, how can you do this? This will affect people's confidence. And so he made a training rule. If a monk has a robe made that is the standard robe measure or larger, it has to be cut down and he commits an offense entailing confession. This is the standard robe measure, nine standard hand spans long and six wide. So from this account, we see another aspect to Venerable Nanda at the time, this was before he became an Arahant, that he was still prone to conceit, still prone to adornment, wanting to wear a nice robe, maybe even wanting to get a bit of the shine of the Buddha. So this is not a good quality. And hence the training rule to ensure that monks, they wear a, a robe that is fitting to them. And we hear from Venerable Nanda in his own words. This is in the Nanda Theragatha. And he says, because of unwise contemplation, engaging in adornment, I was haughty, fickle, and afflicted with sensual lust, with the profitable way of the Buddha, kinsman of the sun, having wisely entered upon the path, I removed craving for existence from the mind. So in the case of Venerable Nanda Thera, you can see unwise contemplation, ayoniso manisikara. So he saw beauty instead of what it was repulsive, expecting happiness instead of dukkha, taking it as me and mine and expecting it to last. These are the things that you unwisely contemplate. And then he admitted to engaging in adornment. So painting his eyes and also wearing nice robes, holding a nice bowl. And then he admits to being haughty, fickle, so there's a level of conceit over what is me and mine, and also a fickle nature going for frivolous things, and of course, afflicted with sensual lust. Looking at what he overcame, we all have these things when we're caught in the net of being bonded to sensual pleasures, we get caught in the net. And so when he came to the Buddha's way, the profitable path, then that was only the time that he could develop the mind and see through these things, see it as troubling, see it as shameful, see it as disgusting. And I think the thing that is most inspiring is that with all these different qualities that he was afflicted by, particularly sensual lust, the lust for sense pleasures, that he became the foremost at guarding the doors to the sense faculty. And in many ways, it does make sense that when you're so overcome with sensual passion, desire, attachment, intimacy, all those kinds of things that create the bond, that deepen the craving, 
that when you overcome it, of course, you realize you see the danger. So clearly, as the foremost one of the monk disciples who guards the doors to the sense faculties, he becomes the exemplary role model for seeing the danger in sensual pleasures. We also hear the Buddha praise Venerable Nanda in the Nanda Sutta in Anguttarnikaya chapter 8, discourse number 9. The Buddha says, Because one speaking rightly would say of Nanda that he is a clansman, that he is strong, that he is graceful, and that he is strongly prone to lust. How else could Nanda lead the complete and pure spiritual life unless he guarded the doors of the sense faculties, observed moderation in eating, was intent on wakefulness, and possessed mindfulness and clear comprehension? And he goes on to explain how he did those things. Now what's very important is that in the first instance he's declaring the factual elements about Venerable Nanda, that he's a clansman, that he's strong, that he is reputed to be graceful, and that he was strongly prone to lust. But then he explains how he turns it around by developing the accomplishments in guarding the doors of the sense faculties, observing moderation in eating and being intent on wakefulness. So these are the sacred qualities. And he possessed mindfulness and clear comprehension. Now, when we look at this, what's very evident is that he overcame all the challenges, all the things that were quite difficult for him. And so it's inspiring that aspect to see that he turn that all around, that it is possible, despite what we ourselves may think in the same way to Nanda, that this spiritual path is hard, that this spiritual path we're not excelling. But if we follow the instructions of the Buddha, if we apply ourselves, if we stay to the sacred qualities that enable the path, then it is possible for us as well. One final thing before we end this session, it's really to look at the conditions for guarding the sense doors. So this is a very good opportunity to look at this because Venerable Nanda became the foremost at this particular accomplishment. And so when you look at the qualities that he had and you look at what he did, it's possible to see what were the conditions for him turning that around. So one of them is definitely to know that there is danger in sense pleasures. This was something that the Buddha kept pointing out to him and also what the monks kept reproving him for. So that was very helpful to initially see that danger because clearly in the early accounts, he wasn't seeing that danger. He was favoring the sense pleasures. Now, the other aspect of his particular story is that he was actually quite conceited and arrogant. The way that he would wear the nice robes, the way that he would carry a nice bowl, paint his eyes, there was a certain arrogance in how he still dealt with sense pleasures. Now, when we meditate on the inside pathway for Karaniya Metta Sutta, we know that non-arrogance, anathimani, is the condition for controlling the sense faculties. So, santindriyo. So, santindriyo is very similar to guarding the doors to the sense faculties and also to sense restraint. So, when he started to humble himself, when he started to see the foolishness in his behavior, cultivate more humbleness, then what is evident is that this lends itself to being able to guard the sense doors. Because when you're arrogant, you take it for granted and you think you can tolerate sense pleasures. You think you can still wield these things, handle them, enjoy them without any repercussions. And as a result of that, you could see during Venerable Nanda's story that he struggled. It was only when he was shamed, when he found it troubling himself, and when he was disgusted with it, that taking delight in this way is not a good thing. And so at that point, probably the arrogance, he was able to drop that, because it's only through non-arrogance that you can start to guard. The second aspect is really around the Avija Sutta, so when you look at what are the conditions that lead to restraining the sense faculty, which is very similar to guarding the sense doors, you see that it starts with associating with good persons. So sapurisa sangsevo. Then it leads to hearing the true Dhamma, so Dhamma savanam. That leads to conviction, which is the sadda. From there you have wise contemplation, yoniso manasikara. And from there it leads to mindfulness and clear comprehension, Sati Sampajanya. 
And then of course, that leads to restraining the sense faculties. So if you look at this, he's very lucky because when he went to the monastery and then ordained, he was associating with good persons. It was the Buddha that kept pointing it out to him, not to be enamored with all the sense pleasures and not to be taken over by sensual bonds, beginning with sensual lust. So it was also the monks who were saying to him, you are foolish, you are, you are worthy of being reproved. So it's by associating with these good persons that it led to him hearing the true Dhamma. So he heard from the monks, he heard from the Buddha, the true Dhamma. And then it increased the conviction towards the path. So when he applied himself, when he no longer was upset at the spiritual life, instead he went towards the spiritual life with gusto, with energy, with effort, went to wear rag robes and to actually dwell in the forest. That was part of increasing his conviction. And when it comes to wise contemplation, he was able to then master wise contemplation, as he said in his own words, what we heard. And then of course the Buddha confirms he had mindfulness and clear comprehension. So these are all the conditions that he was able to cultivate, develop, which enabled him to become the foremost at guarding the doors to the sense faculties. And so that led to fruits on the path. So he's an exemplary role model in this respect. There's much we can learn from it, more than what we've spoken about. It's good to contemplate this in your own time, to deliberate his story, to look at the qualities that he himself declared as unwholesome qualities, and then to look at how he turned it around. We can end our session here. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem. Wishing you well. Peruan Saranai.